If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell icon to get the latest updates. Um, presentation it talks about workday recruiting and things you need to do to prep for it. So, you know, in the last session, we saw uh, different decisions that needed to be made and how to configure by going into the tenant setup. And we had to like either uh, make a particular choice within the uh, edit tenant system or edit recruiting or edit HCM. And we made different decisions. Uh, so this one particular presentation, this is actually by Workday. Uh, it talks about the different considerations that uh, companies should go through uh, for preparing for Workday. So, and then the reason I want to go through this with you guys is so that um, given that this module is very huge, this document or what we'll go through, I'll give you all of the talking points that you need to consider in as part of the new implementation or things that you need to be aware of. Like uh, these are the decisions that have been made. Uh, if you're supporting an implementation that's already uh, done, but these are the key things that you need to ask for, like what were the decisions made in these particular areas? So from that perspective, while it's just, it's not actually going into the system, but I think it's good awareness of uh, things we need to be aware of uh, for recruiting. Um, implementation. So this particular slide, it talks about staffing models and it could, recruiting could use both position management and job management, but the company needs to decide which one they're going to go with. Um, I'll talk about the pros and cons of each. So if you need to do a lot of hiring and you need to do a lot of fast hiring, like in a retail environment, where there's a lot of turnover, um, you should use job management. Also, if you're a agile company, like in a Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of flexibility, and you do not need a lot of control, then you should be using job management. If the company uh, wants to have a very controlled process where you have an approval flow, and you could only hire within certain cost centers, certain you know certain orgs, and you need a department head to approve uh, each time before you create a position or you hire someone. In that case, you should use position management. Uh, the step to hire someone is longer when you use position management. And it's also a little bit more cumbersome. Like every time you do a promotion or you do a termination, you have to deal with what uh, what are you going to do with that position that will be left behind in case of a termination or a transfer. So if the company wants to be nimble and fast as far as this hiring process, then they should be using job management and not position management. Uh, I have. I have a question, please. On this one also, on the position management, are you going to talk about the business process for this? Um, the position, yeah, we will talk about how to create a position because that's part of the, uh, you know, it's part of creating the requisition. Okay, because I have heard before, like business process for position management. I was like, okay, what is even that, you know? Because they say it's like part of the process, you know. Okay. So um, I think you're asking, um, are you talking about the actual, like creating a position or are you asking like what is position management and what is job management? Because, uh, uh, no, like the business process, I believe for position, I think the business process for position management is like higher, you know, or... Okay, like that, like that process. Yeah, so position, like when you create a position within Workday, 
is actually, you know, is BP position, uh, is create position. And the end product of that is that you have what's called a position and then you could hire against that position. If you don't have position management, then you just go to the, you just go to the organization and then you just say, hey, hire someone. And for job so, management, we don't need no business process for job management, correct? We don't need a position uh, with job management. We, we just go to the, like we're gonna say, for example, we have an organization called Andrews organization. We just go to that org organization and then we just click on hire. And then we, you could create the hire record. But if you're using position management, you cannot just hire, you need to have a position before you could hire. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, job requisitions are required for workday recruiting. So the things we want to uh, consider is, do you want to require job requisitions for organizations using position management? Or do you want to require job requisitions based on specific rules? Or do you want to use job requisitions for organizations using job management? And then also the numbering scheme. You know, typically companies just start with R and some sequence that starts with something. So this is, um, we saw yesterday where you set this up on, within the Workday application. And we also saw the ability to override the hiring restrictions. Is there a configuration system where you can reset that naming convention, the number at any point of time? Um, you no, know, if you reset it, you're gonna, uh, unless you, via that EIB, you renumber everything else, you're gonna end up uh, causing a conflict. Okay. Right, updating the prior numbers in the new set right. that you want and resetting them, okay. Yeah, you, yeah, it would, you know, it would definitely be nice, as I mentioned yesterday, like the company I'm really looking for, they're going to be rolling the this module. So, you know, like from the process from A to it will definitely, I will, you know, uh, it will really benefit me, you know. Yep. Yeah. Um, whether or not a company is going to have job requisition compensation as part of it. So there's a step within the process in which you could allow the recruiter or someone to enter the salary, uh, the proposed salary, I should say. Uh, so that is a decision point because that page where you enter the compensation is optional. You could add it or not based on that decision. And uh, if the company decides not to, they could easily change it going forward in the future. So um, this is about the compensation page, whether it should be added or not. Hey, isn't the compensation already in place when the position is created? So, uh, as you no. know, the position management, no? No, so there is a page. Uh, the page is called like request comp and on that one is you enter what, you know, you have the salary range mm -hmm. and yeah, you also have, you know, if there's going to be any kind of like a bonus or something. So that page, it needs to be made part of the, uh, the requisition process if you do want it that way. I mean, I'm sorry, the range, usually the range is already set. Yeah, the range is, and the range would be there. Which in pay grades, right. Okay. And offer defines the final pay. Yeah. Um, which um, there's something called evergreen requisitions. So if companies that are doing a lot of hiring like retail, uh, they might enable this uh, evergreen requisitions. These are basically, uh, they're not tied to any particular position, but you create this requisition so you could just have candidates against it. And you could move the candidate to job requisitions and back to Evergreen if necessary. So you collect all the candidates against your Evergreen requisition. So the reason it's called Evergreen, right? Like, like this is green always, like this is open always. So candidates could apply to it. 
And then you take the candidate from your evergreen requisition, and then you attach it to your actual job requisition. So it so you don't have to keep on opening up a new rack every time you need to collect more resumes, especially in a fast hiring uh, environment. So this is what is generally provided as part of job management option if you select right. Yeah, this is well, this is uh, in part of uh, a functionality just called Evergreen, and you have to use it for high volume, high turnover, or highly specialized jobs. Retail jobs, kind of. Yeah. yeah. If you have a candidate against the Evergreen, you cannot make an offer or hire from an Evergreen requisition. So you have to move them to a regular job requisition. Um, Another big point is uh, job profile data, such as job description and qualifications, should they be automatically pre-populated on the job requisition? So that means like if you have a particular job profile called business analyst, there should be some kind of description of what is a business analyst. And then you would consider like if you want to default in that uh, job description, on the job requisition. So in order to do that, uh, the company should have job descriptions and summaries so that when they create the job requisition, it will default in. If they don't have that, then the recruiter has to enter the description or the summary at the time of creating the requisition. So we don't have to create the job profile. Uh, yeah, during within recruiting, you don't have to create the job profile. Uh, because this should be actually just part of the HCM process that there are job profiles. But if a company is using recruiting, they need to decide if they're going to pre-populate the job description and the qualifications for each job profile so that it would pre-populate on the requisition. Okay. So this shows that um, you have a particular job profile, for example, um, administrative, and it has a job family. Um, you know, that's linked to that job profile. And then there is a tab called job classifications. And there's also a job profile summary, description, and additional description. So if you enter information here on the job profile, then it will default into the requisition. If there is no information here, then it won't. Um, Ramesh, um, are the job profiles um, um, details filled in along with while creating the job, the position or jobs in job management? Uh, you would select the, when you create a position, you have to select the job profile. And then based on that job profile, you will have to populate the uh, description and the qualifications. Right. So this is saying that if you already have this information on the job profile, right. then it would automatically default onto the... So for the even the position to be created, there should be a job profile out there that would match the position description or pull that information into the position. Correct. Okay. You need a job profile in order to create a job, uh, in order to create a job position. or position, jobs or positions, right? Either of them. Correct. Got it. Thanks. Question though, I see on the, I see the job, I see the job code. It's like those information, like how do we get do, this, those information? Because I see, I see the red asterisk on that. Yeah. Uh, so this is within the HCM system. You could, um, look up an employee and then on their job page, you will see their job profile and the job code. And then from there, you could dig, uh, that would be an active hyperlink. And you could, um, you could from that page, you could go into the job profile data. You can see all of the data on that, um, for that job profile. So navigate from the employee job and then into the job details. That's one way. You could also uh, search for job profile as a report. And I'm sure there's some report already called job profiles. And based on that report, based on a job, 
on the job profile, we should find the job code. Correct, it will have the job codes there. Okay, so, okay, okay. So we don't have to worry about creating the job code. Um, yeah, it would be created by the compensation administrator. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there are certain fields which have, you could change the label and in order to show to the external candidates, you wanna make a little bit of a more user-friendly label. So for example, you might have um, location and um, the location might make sense to an employee, but that location name may not make sense to uh, an external person. So you could change the label of the location so they're more user-friendly. And also certain uh, terms, uh, there's something called um, maintain labels. So you could change uh, what work they calls it and you could give it a more user-friendly label. And that's what that label will show up um, to, to the external workers. Uh, one thing to make sure is that some labels, if you change them in one place, they will not only change for the external, but they will change for everywhere else uh, globally. Even, you know, so other people who are using Workday, they need to be aware that you're making a change to the label. Is there a way, a way to look up um, what are the global labels versus um, localized domain or functional area labels? Uh, no, I think it's just, I know all of the compensation related labels, okay. they're, if you make a change to them, it's global. Oh, okay. Um, and that just, you know, from experience, there was nothing that told me that, hey, this is only gonna be uh, within a certain scope. Okay. Um, so here's an example, like you may have a location name called building one, two, three, which may make sense to an internal employee, but candidates for them on that location field, you could change it to something, you know, that's more descriptive. So this shows that on the create location, um, on that same page, at the bottom, it says default job posting location. So you have location and then you have job posting location. It is the same location, but the whatever name that's given in the job posting location is what will show up on the external requisitions or external job posting. So a company needs to decide to go ahead and update all of their locations with more uh, candidate friendly labels. Um, in this example, it's saying that on a worker summary, when an internal candidate applies, um, it, it makes sense for to allow the employee to have what's called a upload, uh, upload my, um, by default, this widget called my experience or education or job history, this may not be available uh, on this employee profile. By default, a lot of companies don't have these areas, education or job history or a way to upload their resume. But if they're going to be using recruiting, or if they are using recruiting, it makes sense to enable uh, these sections as well. So that's what this is talking about. That so that when the when the employee applies for the job, this is the information that gets pulled into that profile. So if there's nothing here, then it's not going to pull anything. Um, and then there's something called questionnaires. And you can have a separate questionnaire for external candidates versus internal. And these are questions that are designed to ask the, ask the candidate some particular questions to see if they're really qualified for that job. 
and based on what they answer, they could be disqualified. So we're saying that um, you should prepare some question, uh, questionnaires if they're gonna use them or they're not gonna use them, but this is something, there's functionality to be uh, implemented. And it could have up to 25 questions per questionnaire. I think that would be a little too much. Um, And then it talks about uh, the work they're recruiting. You know, it, it has that dynamic job application process. So you want to make sure that you consider all of the different steps and the flow and make sure you know who, who are all the stakeholders during in that process. So you could build them in into the process flow. So we'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, but this is a screenshot of the, you know, that dynamic job requisition business flow. And it's giving an example of where you, you could actually have steps that someone could review and make edits. So like in this one, uh, there's a step for the recruiter to review the job requisition. And there's a step called request requisition compensation um, if they're going to utilize comp. And if there's going to be, there's also a assigned roles. So when you're creating a, when you're creating a requisition there, you know, if you want to have a step to indicate who will be the recruiter and who will be the recruiting administrator. So that's another step. We will see that when we're creating a requisition, it will, ask us to assign roles. And then uh, there's a job posting step where you indicate for this requisition where it's gonna be posted to. Uh, similarly, you know, th this one is the job requisition one. There's a close job requisition business process with certain criteria that needs to be thought out of how the workflow is going to be. And then it talks about things to consider. Um, Workday allows you to make an external career site. Uh, you, could do, you could have more than one. Typically companies have one Workday hosted external site and one internal uh, website. But both of these websites will be hosted by Workday and you'll have the link within Workday, but you could uh, definitely make, configure that career site uh, with your own logo and colors and branding and put videos on it, uh, have analytics running on it. So here's an example of the template for the external career site you could put a logo. Uh, this could also be a video now. This is a new functionality. I think it just came out in the last, not this release, but the release before. You could have a video running um, or a banner and this search criteria that should show up on the left-hand side and a login page and a language selection. So things you could do on that, you could have your own banners, logo, analytics, if you need any terms and conditions, like a cookie policy message. Um, do you want to force the candidate to create a account or you want to keep that as an optional step? So those are all the things to consider when creating an external site. And then obviously there's also the about us message, resume parsing message, and uh, country specific terms and conditions. Um, this is also optional to have a candidate home. Uh, it could be an optional where they could create an account after someone submits an application or 
you could force the candidate to create an account first and then log in and then apply. So it's a lot of um, flexibility in that. So this is what the candidate home looks like. So once they create uh, an account, then they will have a welcome page. And then they will also have any of their pending tasks or the jobs they have applied for and the next steps. So this will be kind of a landing page for the candidate. So it's really helpful. Um, so whether, and you get to select which statuses you're gonna show to the candidate and then you can have your own label. So internally, you might have different statuses, um, but you could all, you can map all of these to in progress. Like if you don't wanna tell them that this is under review screen or review or screening or interview, uh, you could do a mapping. So think more user friendly. Sorry, uh, Ramesh, going back into the earlier career site, career sites, say supposing um, users are coming from uh, third party career sites, um, can not the external career site, I'm talking about the third party sites, <coughs> um, uh, Indeeds or Dice or whatever. And if they submit the data from there, um, will the system still ask them to create a um, a account within the site or um, it doesn't, or can we enforce that? So out of the box, it's not gonna allow you to submit from like DICE directly into work, right? There has to be some kind of uh, integration set up for it. Okay. And, then, and that integration, as you're bringing in that data, it will need to create some kind of a authentication ID right. uh, as part of that. But it's out of the box, uh, it, it's not going to do that. Okay, thank you. And where you can put the banners. So this is helpful. And then for agency setup. Uh, things that you could allow their agency to do. So I'll go ahead and just post this on the LMS so we can move on. And we talked about the some of the security roles. Uh, there's a primary recruiter, secondary recruiter. And then as far as um, cutover strategy, like if your company is using an uh, uh, ATS currently, and then they're gonna go to Workday, uh, Workday recommends that you do a clean break uh, instead of trying to import all of the data, um, you, you kind of sunset one application and then uh, do a clean start with Workday. So there's some data that you may want to bring into Workday, but they would prefer it to be, um, you know, try to bring in the least data as possible because they will add time and cost to the project. Yeah, but so, generally the clients like their applicant data. <laughs> they use it I, all. Yeah. So here's what they recommend that which should be converted over. Like if they have like um, open racks and positions, um, that can be converted, converted as part of the data conversion and brought into the new system. Um, the candidate information, so like their name, address, contact info, skills and experience. So you could definitely bring it over, but it will, the consulting company will actually charge uh, a lot more for that. So the applicants have to re-register anyways in the new system, right? Correct. Um, and then here's a list of things that they don't recommend to bring over, like their disposition history, uh, notes, communication history, you know, interview like previous, assessment or interview data. And then basically kind of going through what things to consider for the data conversion uh, and the data migration strategy. So you guys can read that on your own. Um, there's definitely local and global 
um, rules that you could implement uh, as far as integrations, whether you're gonna have a background check and assessment or job boards uh, by out of the box, even though there is a background check status, it really doesn't do anything unless you actually build a integration with the background check vendor. And then also um, any intranet or internet websites that you need to post your jobs to. And then finally, you know, the whole change management and training to get people excited about the new features, et cetera. And then it's got some links on the community for those of you guys who have access to it. <coughs> so I think this is a good resource. I'll post it on LMS. This is from Workday, uh, but I think it's good to review and good, uh, good stuff to talk about during the interview process. Okay, so yesterday uh, we talked about some of the setups. Um, today I'm going to talk about what's called the recruiting hub. This is a, a major improvement that was launched only last year. So even if a company is on recruiting, if they didn't have time for it, they're probably not using the recruiting hub. Um, because you could definitely use recruiting without the recruiting hub. Uh, it does take a little bit of setup, but not a lot. Um, but it is something that's very useful. So what recruiting hub is that if you're a recruiter or a manager, then you see this um, dashboard. It's like one place with all of your action items and all of your recruiting data. So let me make this one a little bit bigger. Um, and you have this left-hand panel, and then you have this pipeline, and you have these what's called cards that you could move around. So let me give you a demo of that within the system, and then we'll talk about how to configure it. So is it like a dashboard or something, or a worklet? Uh, so this is called a recruiting hub. And this means that it's like one place with all of this data, Prior to this, uh, so this was introduced in, I believe, March or April of last year. Okay. Uh, prior to this, you had a recruiting worklet. So either you had to use the reports to get the candidates, uh, but there was no one place. And then you had to go to, the recruiter had to go to their inbox to find all of the items they had to do. But you know, if, you, if you've seen the work to inbox, Right. Uh, if you have like 30 or 40 items in there, it's very hard to sort and filter and search. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was very difficult for recruiters to use because they have to deal with like, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. of candidates. So it's hard to find their items in the inbox. Yeah. So this was a huge improvement. So let me go into the system as a recruiter and uh, we'll see. Uh, them of that. Um, can you guys see the um, the workday server? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm clicking on it, but it's not responding to uh, my clicks. So the task name or what is the name? Configure default hub. Is that what we are? Yeah. Well, let me um, start from the GUI and then we'll get into how to configure it. Okay. Uh, I wonder why it's not detecting my mouse. I think I might have to log in again. Oh, the connection has been lost.
So I'm just connecting to the remote desktop. So while it's doing that, um, I'm just kind of go through it based on the screenshot. On the recruiting hub, you'll see different um, areas at the bottom. These are called cards. So there's an offer card, referral cards. So this is basically all the items that are in the inbox that are related to offer. They will be shown. They will show up on the offer card, and the items that are on, you know, this is basically it. It categorizes the items that are in, in in the inbox by certain, you know, task categories, and that way it's easy to find who you need to act on. And you could actually, uh, the end user, they could move this uh, how they want to line up the cards. They could add additional cards to it, or they wanna. They could remove cards from it as well. And it's a end user configuration. And it's not letting me go into the recruiting. It's not in, into the remote desktop. So let me try one more thing. Okay, I'm going to log into the WorkJS uh, TMS. And so at least we'll be able to go through the security setup for it. Um, the domain that controls the security for this is called recruiting. And then from there, we go to the recruiting hub uh, security policy. Question though, I'm not sure it's probably not part of this, um, but what's the difference between the domain security and the business process security? Uh, so domain is the overall area and business process security is the, um, the security for that transaction or for that workflow. So uh, domain could be human resources, like who have access to personal data, uh, but that's, that doesn't determine who could initiate an address change. So the actual, when you're thinking of business process, think about the actual transaction, like who could do that transaction and who will approve that transaction. And the domain is who has access to the data within that, uh, within that function. I see. So basically someone can have a business process security, but 
don't need to have a domain security, correct? If they don't have, um, yeah, I mean, there's gonna be exceptions to it, but if they want to be able to just do the transaction, they will need business process security, uh, but they will not be able to see the data if they don't have domain uh, access to it. So it will be, while it's technically possible, but not really like, if you don't have access to the compensation domain, meaning you don't have access to people's salary, how can you do a job change? Right? Those fields will not show up uh, even though you have access to do the transaction. I see. So it will make more sense to the person who have domain security. And, and so if someone don't have it, that means that we'll have to create a domain security and business process security, correct? For that? Right. Okay. Um, Is that also the role, like the person, also the role, right? Uh, it depends how big the company is, right? Like if it's a smaller company, and the, the same person might be doing the security and other things. If it's a very large company, you might have different like teams who do different things. Okay. And the last question on that one. So you can have domain security and business process security, but you don't need you don't you don't need to have a role, correct? Uh, no, I think uh, you always need a role or a group, whether it's going to be a domain policy or uh, you know or or a business process security. I see. So so okay. So so definitely you need the three: the role, the domain, and the security. Let's say if it's somebody that need to make some changes the system. So they will need the role, domain, and security. If someone like like a HR partner, they need to be able to change the data. So mm -hmm. they need they need access to that domain, and then they need access to the business process, and then they could do that transaction. And the HR partner, this is like the role, right? Correct. The HR partner is the role. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go into the security domain for the recruiting hub, uh, because that is new functionality. It may not be uh, set up yet. So you have to go into, um, one way for me to remember this task name, I just call it domain fun area. So if you just think domain fun area, then the, the actual task name shows up domain security policy for functional area. So, but just think of it as domain fun area, and then it will show up. And then we're gonna choose the recruiting functional area. We'll let that page load up. So basically this will be like the very first step. Yes. Okay. Okay, so now I finally logged into the uh, remote desktop. But anyways, yeah, and this is still loading. Oh gosh. So, let me just try here. Uh, domain fund area. So here's the domain. There's a description of the whole domain. And these are all the, <coughs> all the subdomains within that. 
And the one we're interested in right now is the recruiting hub. So I'm gonna to try to find that. Okay, so here's the recruiting hub. Okay. And so in this case, since it's already active, someone has already, you know, added in the security groups. Um, but if it was not active, first you have to click here and you have to activate the domain. So right now it's already active. So the only choice is disable. If it was not active, then there will be a choice of activating it. You would need to activate it. And then you would edit the permissions and you would add in the groups that will have access to it. So we see that the recruiter unconstrained group and manager unconstrained group has access to it. Um, some companies issue they face is that this domain is only available to the unconstrained groups. So if you have HR admin or you have a recruiting administrator, who, which is a user-based group, uh, they will not have access to the recruiter hub. Uh, and that's very frustrating for them because they want the administrator to have access to it. But unfortunately that's a uh, workday constraint that they have built this domain only for the unconstrained groups and only recruiter and manager. Um, so the, the, you know, the recruiting assistant or the HR admin, they don't have access to that recruiting hub, but this is where you go to set it up for at least for the recruiter and the manager. So if a manager is given access on this, he can see pretty much um, all the job breaks from every organization. That's how unconstrained is, right? Correct. And even so, for the recruiter, unless they are a higher top level partners, uh, this would give access to every position out there in the yeah. entire organization, the whole company. Okay. So now I will go ahead and ask the recruiter so we could actually see the recruiting hub. Okay. So this left-hand bar right here, this is, gives you access to the recruiting hub. And you could expand it by clicking on this arrow. So then it opens up and you have direct access to all of your recruiting activities. And you have this announcement and then the pipeline and the different cards. And this is built for, there's some default setup, you know, that you could, you, you could specify what are the default cards, but the end user has the power to move them. So you click here and then you have a choice move or remove. So you click on move and then you could just move that card to a different location. You could also remove it. And I believe there's like nine different cards. Um, so once again, this is surfacing everything that's in your inbox, but it's, but it's on these cards so that it's easy to get to. So I'm not gonna remove it. Uh, let me just unclick out of that. And if I want to add a new card, you have to do it from here. There's this tiny link called add card. Okay, so in this case, I already have 10 cards. So let me remove a card and then I could add it. So I'm gonna remove background check.
Now I could add employment agreement task. So once a end user modifies this, the default setting is gone. You cannot go back to the default setting. And then um, you have this candidate list as well, which sorts them by their uh, stage or any of the other columns that you want to. And this functionality called uh, mass move, like you could select all of them and move them to a different stage. This functionality is also new. Uh, this was also um, rolled out in March of last year. So it's not even been one year since this function functionality, uh, but it's very helpful. Before that, you had to do one by one or by a particular org. And so this is called mass move. We saw how to move the cars. And, and then these are the shortcuts. So the shortcuts that you want to apply over here, this is also, there's a domain and there's also a widget that allows you to select what the uh, shortcut is going to be that you want to display over here for the recruiters. So just like we saw the domain for recruiting hub, uh, there was also domains for all of these areas and where you actually maintain the setup. And this is still loading, so I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. Okay. Um, okay. So we talked about moving, removing, or adding new cars to it. Um, this feature is role-based for recruiters only, not user-based groups. Okay, here's a screenshot of the domain. Okay, and then just like we saw the recruiting hub skirt policy, there's another one that you should be aware of is called candidates for my jobs. So if you give recruiter or uh, admin access to that policy, then they will have access to the candidate menu item, the candidate cards and the pipeline card. Uh, there's also the setup tenant setup general, and this is the access that they will get if you add that role to the security policy. So it's good to be aware of. And then a couple of tasks as the as the workday HRIS person or support person you should be aware of. So there's the configure default shortcuts. And then uh, there's like the maintain hub where you could configure the announcements and such. Okay. So just a couple of uh, tasks and domain policies. And this is just one little area and there's like, you know, we spent almost like an hour on it. So I do want to show a little bit of the onboarding. I'm gonna kind of step, uh, skip ahead to onboarding because uh, one of our students really wants to see that. Um, so I'm gonna kind of change gears and show the onboarding business process and then we'll call it a day after that
Um, so first of all, the business process has to be enabled in the system. Um, that is a implementation level task. So we're not gonna get into that, but uh, VP must be active. And if it is active, you could easily modify it. And the name of that is just onboarding. And if a company had made a copy of it, it might be onboarding for, you know, Cisco or onboarding for, you know, whatever. You could also have separate onboarding process for each um, organization or even a cost center. So that's why we see so many different versions of it. Uh, typically, it just makes sense to have like one or two versions of it based on the country. Or even you could even just have one and then put in the condition rules so that um, you only go to the steps based on the country requirements. So I'm looking for the onboarding default definition from here. So this business process controls what the pre-hire sees when they when they're past the when they have accepted the offer. So once they have accepted the offer, now they are a pre-hire and they could come into workday and they could do these tasks that are listed here. Uh, so, but as part of the business process. If you want to see who could initiate this, uh, the initiating groups would be listed here, and there should be a pre-hire or uh, employee itself should be listed here somewhere. In the real world, you will have. Uh, not just the HR partner, but you will actually have the employee or the pre-hire. So there should be another group here called uh, pre-hire, and then you should also have an employee as self as the initiating uh, as part of the group. And the steps that are available to them, let me make this bigger. See, employee as self would only um, only be in the picture if this is automatically kicked off upon acceptance of offer or something like that, right? Yeah. Or so acceptance be, of, sorry, background check, approval of change yeah. background status. Something, you need some user to kick it off. Uh, so, but once it's kicked off, then uh, based on the type of a uh, person, like whether it's a continued worker or employee, they will get a task. All of them will get it, like, you know, if it's a continued worker or employee, they will get a task to enter the their personal information. And then they will enter their contact information. And there is also the complete I-9. Uh, this is an action. So if a company chooses to do I-9 through Workday, all they have to do is add this step within the onboarding uh, uh, business process. And then Workday has a built-in condition that this step will, will only trigger to employees, not contractors. And then it would only trigger if the primary job is located in the US and the person is not a, like a, uh, rehire. So there's really no additional thing you have to do. If you have this step within that business process, then when the employee gets to this step, they see the I nine, the electronic online version of the I nine form, and they fill that out, and then they submit it, and which the you know, like the immigration person has to do, they have to like visually check the uh, passport or driver's license. But as far as the entering the information is, uh, 
as long as you have the security set up to view the form, uh, there's no additional things that you need to do. But how do you add the INAN in Workday? Uh, the INAN is, is a delivered functionality. The I9 page is already, the electronic version of I9 is already there. It's already there. Yes. Okay. And then after that, you know, there has the change benefit elections and, and so on. So if you look at some of the other onboarding processes, they don't have the I9 in it. So, I think I got disconnected from the remote server because it's not responding. Uh, what I was gonna show was you go into the business process and from the related actions, you know those three dots, you click on them and then you could edit the business process and then you could click on the plus button and add the I9 step or if you choose not to do the I9 through Workday, you could just click on the minus and remove the step. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you know, it would be great maybe if you can demo, like, I don't know, if you can. Uh, I mean, I think we, we could demo it. We just need to create a new hire and okay. then bring them up to the onboarding steps. So maybe in some of the. Appreciate it. Thank you. And question though, we said the domain security policy for uh, for recruiting, it's the it's the task is domain security policy for functional area. So I'm also assuming that the business process is also business process for functional area, correct? And the functional area will come and will select recruiting. Um, for the business processes, like the workflows, the task is. You actually have to go to the uh, the BP, and under the related actions, there is a uh, business process security configuration. So the security for the for the BP is actually on the BP itself, underneath the related actions. So there's no task for that. Correct. So you you modify it by navigating to the BP itself. BP and then business process and you click on the related action. Yes. I, I, I will go ahead and stop the class right now. I'll upload this page on the LMS, but I do want you guys to go to uh, the remote server and maybe you guys will have better luck than I am because it's, it keeps disconnecting today. Yeah. Uh, but I do want you guys to uh, do one thing is to go to the questionnaires and requisition tab of this and create a question. Uh, just create, you know, just using this uh, menu name. It was you here. You could type create question, edit question, delete question, and then you could group those questions into a questionnaire. You could also just view a questionnaire and you could also see that there has been questionnaires that are attached to a requisition. So at least create some question, view the existing one, and then create a job requisition. So the task name is create job requisition, which I show on the, on the screenshot. And just go through the steps. Uh, Put in any you know information that makes sense, like post internally, externally, and just go through all of the steps. And the last step is going to be post job. Uh, I think there's there's one more step in there called assign roles, but at least uh, create a um, create a job requisition before we meet next time. Okay. All right, guys. Um, and see you guys on Monday. Thank you for attending the session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. 
Also feel free to ask your questions in the comment section below, and we will reply to them at the earliest.